Welcome to Heavy D Storytelling. We are going to be reading a story. I've noticed that this channel has gone on for a while and I love it. But I hope you guys enjoyed today. First up, we are going to be doing the Bible verse. It will be Hebrews 11, 26 through 27. Then we are going to be going to the Bible verse. No, not the Bible verse. This is the Bible verse. It's actually to the Bible verse. Then we are going to be doing the Bible. Then we are going to be doing the synopsis with Kimberly. And then we are going to be reading. This is my smaller version that I'm reading from. I'm following along. But then we are going to be reading Charlotte's Web. So, hope you guys enjoy. Make sure to hit the like button. Subscribe. Hit the bell and not miss another video. And now we are going to be heading straight into Hebrews. Hebrews 11, 26 through 27. He considered the reproach of Christ greater... Wait. Greater what? Uh, greater than... Why don't you start over? I think you uh, got twisted. Yeah, I got a tongue twister. Okay. Hebrews 11, 26 20 through 27. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the re to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of anger of the king, for he endured as see seeing him who is invisible. I hope you enjoyed that piece of the Bible. Now we're, we are going to be reading a little bit bigger piece of the Bible. Hope you guys enjoy. So, hello everyone. We are going to be reading Micah chapter 3. I am waiting for everyone to have their Bibles open, uh, have them in their laps. Get, get started uh, so that you're ready to read them. Hint, hint, that means everybody in the room. Hello! All right, so this is Micah chapter 3. This is the English Standard Version. Let me begin. And I said, that's not me, I'm sure that's Micah speaking. I, not, not me, Dad. Micah. Dad. I said, maybe it's God speaking. Hear, you heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. Is it not for you to know justice, you who hate the good and love the evil, who tear the skin from off my people and their flesh from off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them and break their bones in pieces and chop them up like meat in a pot, like flesh in a cauldron. Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. He will hide his face from them at that time because they have made their deeds evil. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against him who puts nothing into their mouths. Therefore it shall be night to you without vision, and darkness to you without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets, and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced, and the diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression, and to Israel his sin." Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bribe, its priests teach for a price, its prophets practice divination for money, yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in our midst? or in the midst of us, no disaster shall come upon him. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field, Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house of a wooden, a wooded height. That is the end of Micah chapter 3. I have two 
comments to say about this chapter um, that I thought of while I was reading. The first of all is right before this um, this live stream, we were going through all the books that we read. And one of the books that we started, actually this is the only book that we've started that we haven't read, is Tarzan. And, um, you know, I was expecting it to be kind of a kid story, kind of like the Disney version, you know, yeah. kind of thing. And um, yeah. there were obviously some hints of the Disney version. You can be quiet. Um, there were obviously some hints of the Disney version that were... Um, spattered throughout the text however it was a little bit too gruesome for us and we weren't really interested in um, the reality of the actual story itself and so that's why we stopped reading it well this right here in um, Micah chapter 3 obviously I think that this is a figurative statement that he's making here not a literal one but he says, who tear the skin from off my people and their flesh from off their bones, who eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them, etc., etc., etc. It reminded me of that, mostly because we had Tarzan on our minds um, at the beginning of this, because we went through all the books that we had been reading, um, which maybe at a later date, not today, we might go through them. The second thing that came to mind is that Kimberly has recently read the all of the writings, or what would be called the writings, in the Old Testament, um, and that is basically everything from Joshua through um, the end of the history letters. Right now she's reading Esther, which is, I think, the last of the history letters, or not letters, but history books, um, in the Old Testament. And one of the things... That seems to be the common theme that she says is that all the kings are evil. And the prophets are the answer to all of those evil kings. If you think of it that way, um, it makes the prophets make a little bit more sense. The prophets are the answer to the evil kings. So the prophets are telling the evil kings that... Um, and. All of these, they don't say them in a conditional way, but they are conditional. Because think about Jonah. God said, we're going to destroy Nineveh. But Nineveh repented, and what did they do? Or what did God do? He relented of his destruction, and uh, he didn't destroy Nineveh. So, Jonah so it. time out. I'm the one talking right now. Um, so, um, in the book of Micah, for three chapters so far, and it's going to change in a little bit, but for three chapters so far, it's been talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of Israel, destruction of Judah, um, and that is a response to the evil kings that were living during Micah's time period, and I think those were all um, told to us which kings they were in the first few verses of the book. So, that's kind of what we're talking about when we read the uh, book of Micah and also um, other prophets like Jeremiah and um, I, um, Ezekiel, um, Isaiah. Um, they're talking about the destruction of Israel because of the, it's basically in response to the evil kings that lived during that time. So now we're going to, and it's actually very interesting because a couple, it's either yesterday or the, or the, the uh, session before Kimberly actually even pointed out the, um, asked which, which kings they were because she was going to say, those were evil kings. Well, yeah, that's kind of the point of it. The prophets weren't there during Josiah because Josiah was a good king. He didn't need a prophet to tell him how evil he was. All right. So in the last chapter... Um, there was a, um, let's see, Charlotte spun a web, um, and it was a really cool web. Everybody looked at it and thought it was really cool, and then a fly got into it, and, um, it messed up the whole web, and so they killed Wilbur and had a big feast, and that is the end of the book. Here's Kimberly yeah. to say how it really happened. I understand why you enjoy doing that. It's just, yeah. <laughs> <sighs> so find, find a new way to kill Wilbur every single time. Yikes. Not again. So what happened? Oh, there's hair on Dad's screen. <laughs> it's okay. What happened was Charlotte spun some pig into her web 
And when, um, I forget names, I'm so Zuckerman. sorry. No, it wasn't Zuckerman, it was a hired person. Lurvy. Yeah, Lurvy. When Lurvy came to give Wilbur his food, he saw the web and dropped it and ran in, called Mr. Zuckerman, who looked at it, and then called Mrs. Zuckerman, who looked at it, and it's like, I think the spider's the one that's, like, special. And then they told everybody, and then everybody started wandering around looking at the web every single day, and then, um... Charlotte held a meeting with all the farm animals, except for Templeton, who came in later during the meeting. Uh, she called all the, the farm animals together to find a new word, a new phrase to put into her web, so that um, they'll be impressed and be like, ANOTHER SIGN! IT'S A SIGN FROM THE HEAVENS! Whatever, yada yada yada. <laughs> so, um, eventually Templeton came and um, I think it was one of the sheep who said, who managed to persuade Templeton to get a bunch of magazine clips for Charlotte to copy. Um, because, hey, if Wilbur dies, you won't be able to eat from his food trough. Because they won't put food in an empty pig pen. So that happened. And I'm going to hand it over to Dad, Templeton agreed, by the way, who's going to read us a story. Alrighty. So we are on chapter 13, which is called Good Progress. So let me get started. This is chapter 13 from Charlotte's Web, Good Progress. Far into the night, while the other creatures slept, Charlotte worked on her web. First, she ripped out a few of the orb lines near the center. She left the radio lines alone as they were needed for support. As she worked, her eight legs were a great help to her. So were her teeth. She loved to weave, and she was an expert at it. When she was finished ripping things out, her web looked something like this. A spider can produce several kinds of thread. She uses a dry, a tough thread for foundation lines, and she uses a sticky thread for snare lines, the ones that catch and hold insects. Charlotte decided to use her day thread for writing the new message. If I write the word terrific with sticky thread, she thought, every bug that comes along will get stuck in it and spoil the effect. Now let's see. The first letter is T. Charlotte climbed to a point at the top of the left-hand side of the web. Swinging her spinnerets into position, she attached her thread and then dropped down. As she dropped down, her spinning tubes went into action, and she let out thread. At the bottom, she okay. attached the thread. This formed the upright part of the letter T. Charlotte was not satisfied, however. She climbed up and made another attachment right next to the first. Then she carried the line down so that she had a double line instead of a single line. It will show up better if I make the whole thing with double lines. She climbed back up, moved over about an inch to the left, touched her spinneret to the web, and then carried a line across to the right, forming the top of the T. She repeated this, making it double. Her eight legs were very busy helping. Now for the E. Charlotte got so interested in her work, she began to talk to herself, as though to cheer herself on. If you had been sitting quietly in the barn cellar that evening, you would have heard something like this. Now for the R. Up we go. Attach. Descend. Pay out line. Whoa. Attach. Good. Up you go. Repeat. Attach. Descend. Pay out line. Whoa, girl. Steady now. Attach. Climb. Attach. Over to the right. Pay out line. Attach. <coughs> Excuse me. Now right and down and swing that loop and around and around. Now in to the left. Attach. Climb. Repeat. Okay. Easy. Keep those lines together. Now then. Out and down for the leg of R. Pay out line. Whoa, attach, ascend, repeat. Good girl! And so, talking to herself, the spider worked at her difficult task. When it was completed, she felt hungry. She ate a small bug that she had been saving. Then she slept. Next morning, Wilbur arose, stood beneath the web. He breathed the morning air into his lungs. Drops of dew catching the sun made the web stand out clearly. 
When Lurvy arrived with breakfast, there was the handsome pig, and over him, woven neatly in block letters, the word terrific, another miracle. There's the picture. Lurvy rushed and called Mr. Zuckerman. Mr. Zuckerman rushed and called Mrs. Zuckerman. Mrs. Zuckerman ran to the phone and called the Arables. The Arables climbed into their truck and hurried over. Everybody stood at the pig pen and stared at the web and read the word over and over, while Wilbur, who, felt, who really felt terrific, stood quietly, swelling out his chest and swinging his snout from side to side. Terrific! breathed Zuckerman in joyful admiration. Edith, you better phone the reporter on the Weekly Chronicle and tell him what happened. He will want to know about this. He may want to bring a photographer. There isn't a pig in the whole state that is as terrific as our pig. The news spread. People who had journeyed to see Wilbur when he was some pig came back again to see him now that he was terrific. That afternoon, when Mr. Zuckerman went to milk the cows and clean out the tie-ups, he was still thinking about what a wondrous pig he owned. Lurvy, he called, there is to be no more cow manure thrown into that pig pen. I have a terrific pig. I want that pig to have clean, bright straw every day for his bedding. Understand? Yes, sir, said Lurvy. Furthermore, said Mr. Zuckerman, I want you to start building a crate for Wilbur. I have decided to take the pig to the county fair on September 6th. Make the crate large and paint it green with gold letters. What will the letters say? asked Lurvy. They should say, <clears throat> Zuckerman's famous pig. Lurvy picked up a pitchfork and walked away to get some clean straw. Having such an important pig was going to mean plenty of extra work. He could see that. Below the apple orchard at the end of the path was a dump where Mr. Zuckerman threw all sorts of trash and stuff that nobody wanted anymore. Here in a small clearing hidden by young alders and wild raspberry bushes was an astonishing pile of old bodies bottles not old bodies old charlotte's web just got dark <laughs> an astonishing pile of old bottles and empty tin cans and dirty rags and bits of metal and broken bottles and broken hinges and broken springs and dead batteries and last month's magazines and old discarded dish mops and tattered overalls and rusty spikes and leaky pails and forgotten stoppers and useless junk of all kinds, including a wrong size crank for a broken ice cream freezer. Templeton knew the dump and liked it. There were good hiding places there, excellent cover for a rat, and there was usually a tin can with food still clinging to the inside. Templeton was down there now, rummaging around. When he returned to the barn, he carried in his mouth an advertisement he had torn from a crumpled magazine. How's this? he asked, showing the ad to Charlotte. It says, crunchy. Crunchy would be a good word to write in your web. Just the wrong idea, replied Charlotte. Couldn't be worse. We don't want Zuckerman to think Wilbur is crunchy. He might start thinking about a crisp, crunchy bacon and tasty ham. <laughs> that would put ideas into his head. We must advertise Wilbur's noble qualities, not his tastiness. Go get another word, please, Templeton. Here is a picture of Templeton in the dump. There he is. I predict that Templeton is going to be ecstatic about the new chore that he has to do. The rat looked disgusted. Maybe I was wrong. But he sneaked away to the dump and was back in a while with a strip of cotton cloth. How's this? he asked. It's a label off an old shirt. Charlotte examined the label. It said, pre-shrunk. I'm sorry, Templeton, she said, but... Pre-shrunk is out of the question. We want Zuckerman to think Wilbur is nicely filled out, not all shrunk up. I'll have to ask you to try again. 
What do you think I am, a messenger boy? Grumbled the rat. I am not going to spend all my time chasing down the dump after advertising material. Just once more, please, said Charlotte. I'll tell you what I'll do, said Templeton. I know where there's a package of soap flakes in the woodshed. It has writing on it. I'll bring you a piece of the package. He climbed the rope that hung on the wall and disappeared through a hole in the ceiling. When he came back, he had a strip of blue and white cardboard in his teeth. There, he said triumphantly. How's that? Charlotte read the words with new radiant action. What does it mean? asked Charlotte, who had never used any soap flakes in her life. How should I know? said Templeton. You asked for words and I brought them. I suppose the next thing you'll want me to fetch is a dictionary. Together they studied the soap ad. With new radiant action, repeated Charlotte slowly. Wilbur, she called. Wilbur, who was asleep in the straw, jumped up. Run around, commanded Charlotte. I want to see you in action, to see if you are radiant. Wilbur raced to the end of his yard. Now back again, faster, said Charlotte. Wilbur galloped back. His skin shone. His tail had a fine light curl in it. Jump into the air, cried Charlotte. Wilbur jumped as high as he could. Keep your knees straight and touch the ground with your ears, called Charlotte. Wilbur obeyed. Do a backflip with a half twist in it, cried Charlotte. Wilbur went over backwards, writhing and twisting as he went. Okay, Wilbur, said Charlotte. You can go back to sleep. Okay, Templeton, the soap ad will do, I guess. I'm not sure Wilbur's action is exactly radiant, but it's interesting. Oh, kitten. Daniel, it's your cat. The cat is bringing us a disruption. <laughs> Shall we show a picture of the culprit? <laughs> Sometime. <laughs> Actually, said Wilbur, oh, I feel do. radiant. Do you? said Charlotte, looking at him with affection. Well, you're a good little pig, and radiant you shall be. I'm in this thing pretty deep now. I might as well go the limit. Tired from his romp, Wilbur lay down in the clean straw. He closed his eyes. The straw seemed scratchy, not as comfortable as the cow manure, which was always delightfully soft to lie in. So he pushed the straw to one side and stretched out in the manure. Wilbur sighed. It had been a busy day, his first day of being terrific. Dozens of people had visited his yard during the afternoon, and he had to stand and pose, looking as terrific as he could. Now he was tired. Fern had arrived and seated herself quietly on her stool in the corner. "'Tell me a story, Charlotte,' said Wilbur, as he lay waiting for sleep to come. "'Tell me a story.' So Charlotte, although she too was tired, did what Wilbur wanted. "'Once upon a time,' she began, "'I had a beautiful cousin who managed to build her web across a small stream. "'One day a tiny fish leapt into the air and got tangled up in the web.' My cousin was very much surprised, of course. The fish was thrashing wildly. My cousin hardly dared tackle it, but she did. She swooped down and threw great masses of wrapping material around the fish and fought bravely to catch it. Here's a picture from Charlotte's story. Did she succeed? asked Wilbur. It was a never-to-be-forgotten battle. We're not doing that right now, Kimberly. Here's the culprit. Okay. Uh, maybe we are doing that right now. Um, did she succeed, asked Wilbur. It was a never-to-be-forgotten battle, said Charlotte. There was the fish caught only by one fin and its tail wildly thrashing and shining in the sun. There was the web sagging dangerously under the weight of the fish. How much did the fish weigh? asked Wilbur eagerly. I don't know, said Charlotte. There was my cousin slipping in, dodging out, beaten mercilessly over the head by the wildly thrashing fish, dancing in, dancing out, throwing her threads and fighting hard. First she threw a left around the tail. The fish lashed back. Then a left to the tail and a right in the midsection. The fish lashed back. Then she dodged to one side and threw a right and another right to the fin. Then a hard left to the head while the web swayed and stretched. Then what happened? asked Wilbur. Nothing, said Charlotte. The fish lost the fight. My cousin wrapped it up so tight it couldn't budge. 
Then what happened? asked Wilbur. Nothing, said Charlotte. My cousin kept the fish for a while, and then, when she got good and ready, she ate it. Tell me another story, begged Wilbur. So Charlotte told him about another cousin of hers who was an aeronaut. What is an aeronaut? asked Wilbur. A balloonist, said Charlotte. My cousin used to stand on her head and let out enough thread to form a balloon. Then she let go and be lifted into the air. She'd let go and be lifted into the air and carried upward in onto the warm wind. Is that true? asked Wilbur. Or are you just making it up? It's true, said Charlotte. I have some very remarkable cousins. And now, Wilbur, it's time you went to sleep. Sing something, begged Wilbur, closing his eyes. So Charlotte sang a lullaby with, while crickets chirped in the grass and the barn grew dark. This was the song she sang. Sleep, sleep, my love, my only, deep, deep in the dung and the dark. Be not afraid and be not lonely. This is the hour when frogs and thrushes praise the world from the woods and the rushes. Rest from care, my one and only, deep in the dung and the dark. But Wilbur was already asleep. When the song ended, Fern got up and went home. Chapter 14, Dr. Dorian The next day was Saturday. Fern stood at the kitchen sink drying the breakfast dishes as her mother washed them. Mrs. Arable worked silently. She hoped Fern would go out and play with other children instead of heading for the Zuckerman's barn and to sit and watch animals. Charlotte is the best storyteller I ever heard, said Fern. The blip said Fern, poking her dish towel into a cereal bowl. Fern, said her mother sternly, you must not invent things. You know spiders don't tell stories. Spiders can't talk. Charlotte can, replied Fern. She doesn't talk very loud, but she talks. What kind of story did she tell? asked Mrs. Arable. Well, began Fern, she told us about a cousin of hers who caught a fish in her web. Don't you think that's fascinating? "'Fern, dear, how would a fish get in a spider's web?' said Mrs. Arable. "'You know it couldn't happen. You're making this up.' "'Oh, it happened all right,' replied Fern. "'Charlotte never fibs. This cousin of hers built a web across a stream. "'One day she was hanging around on the web, and a tiny fish leapt into the air and got tangled in the web. "'The fish was caught by one fin, mother. Its tail was wildly thrashing and shining in the sun. "'Can't you just see the web sagging dangerously under the weight of the fish? "'Charlotte's cousin kept slipping in, dodging out, and she was beaten mercilessly over the head by the wildly thrashing thrashing fish, dancing in, dancing out, throwing fern, snapped her mother. Stop it. Stop inventing these wild tales. I'm not inventing, said fern. I'm just telling you the facts. What finally happened, asked her mother, whose curiosity began to get the better of her. Charlotte's cousin won. She wrapped the fish up, then ate him when she got good and ready. Spiders have to eat the same as the rest of us. Yes, I suppose they do, said Mrs. Arable vaguely. Charlotte has another cousin who is a balloonist. She stands on her head, lets out a lot of line, and is carried aloft by the wind. Mother, wouldn't you simply love to do that? Yes, I would come to think of it, replied Mrs. Arable. But Fern, darling, I wish you would play outdoors instead of going to Uncle Homer's barn. Find some of your playmates and do something nice outdoors. You're spending too much time in that barn. It isn't good for you to be alone so much. Alone, said Fern. Alone? My best friends are in the barn cellar. It's a very sociable place, not at all lonely. Fern disappeared after a while, walking down the road toward the Zuckermans. Her mother dusted the sitting room. As she worked, she kept thinking about Fern. It didn't seem natural for a girl to be so interested in animals. Finally, Mrs. Arable made up her mind. She would pay a call on old Dr. Dorian and ask his advice. She got in the car and drove to his office in the village. He works on Saturdays. That's crazy. Dr. Dorian had a thick beard. He was glad to see Mrs. Arable and gave her a comfortable chair. It's about Fern, she explained. Fern entirely, Fern spends entirely too much time in the Zuckerman's barn. It doesn't seem normal. She sits on a milk stool in a corner of the barn cellar near the pig pen and watches animals hour after hour. She just sits and listens. Dr. Dorian leaned back and closed his eyes. 
How enchanting, he said. It must be real nice and quiet down there. Homer has some sheep, hasn't he? Yes, said Mrs. Arable, but it, it all started with that pig we let Fern raise on a bottle. She calls him Wilbur. Homer bought the pig, and ever since it left our place, Fern has been going to her uncle's to be near it. I've been hearing things about that pig, said Dr. Dorian, opening his eyes. They say he is quite a pig. Have you heard about the words that appeared in the spider's web? asked Mrs. Arable nervously. Yes, replied the doctor. Well, do you understand it? asked Mrs. Arable. Understand what? Do you understand how there could be any writing in a spider's web? Oh, no, said Dr. Dorian. I don't understand it. But for that matter, I don't understand how a spider learned to spin a web in the first place. When the words appeared, everyone said they were a miracle. But nobody pointed out that the web itself is a miracle. What's miraculous about a spider's web, said Mrs. Arable. I don't see why you say a web is a miracle. It's just a web. Ever try to spin one? asked Dr. Arable, or Dr. Dorian. Mrs. Arable shifted uneasily in her chair. No, she replied, but I can crochet a doily and I can knit a sock. Sure, said the doctor, but somebody taught you, didn't they? Here's a picture of the meeting that they're having. There's Mrs. Arable and there's Dr. Dorian laying back in his little chair there. And it is very interesting that he works on Saturdays. My mother taught me. Well, who taught the spider? A young spider knows how to spin a web without any instructions from anybody. Don't you regard that as a miracle? I suppose so, said Mrs. Arable. I never looked at it that way before. Still, I don't understand how those words got into the web. I don't understand it, and I don't like what I can't understand. None of us do said Dr. Dorian, sighing. I'm a doctor. Doctors are supposed to understand everything. But I don't understand everything, and I don't intend to let it worry me. Mrs. Arable fidgeted. Fern says the animals talk to each other. Dr. Dorian, do you believe animals talk? I never heard one say anything, he replied. But that proves nothing. It is quite possible that an animal has spoken civilly to me, and that I didn't catch the remark because I wasn't paying attention. Children pay better attention than grown-ups. If Fern says the animals in Zuckerman's barn talk, I'm quite ready to believe her. Perhaps if people talked less, animals would talk more. People are incessant talkers. I can give you my word on that. Well, I feel better about Fern, said Mrs. Arable. You don't think I need to worry about her? Does she look well? asked the doctor. Oh, yes. Appetite good? Oh, yes. She's always hungry. Sleep well at night? Oh, yes. Then don't worry, said the doctor. Do you think she'll ever start thinking about something besides pigs and sheep and geese and spiders? How old is Fern? She's eight. Well, said Dr. Dorian, I think she will always love animals, but I doubt that she spends her entire life in Homer Zuckerman's barn cellar. How about boys? Does she know any boys? She knows Henry Fussy, said Mrs. Arable brightly. Dr. Dorian closed his eyes again and went into deep thought. Henry Fussy, he mumbled. Hmm, remarkable. Well, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Let Fern associate with her friends in the barn if she wants to. I would say offhand that spiders and pigs were fully as interesting as Henry Fussy, yet I predict that the day will come when even Henry will drop some chance remark that catches Fern's attention. It's amazing how children change from year to year. How's Avery? he asked, opening his eyes wide. Oh, Avery, chuckled Mrs. Arable. Avery is always fine. Of course, he gets into poison ivy and gets stung by wasps and bees and brings frogs and snakes home and breaks everything he lays his hands on. He's fine. Good, said the doctor. Mrs. Arable said goodbye and thanked Dr. Dorian very much for his advice. She felt greatly relieved. And that is the end of chapter 14, and all that tells us is that if a doctor says something, you can take his word for it, and that's a fact. 
And um, anyway, <laughs> all right. So, so cool. all right. So that <laughs> is the end. Time out. That is the end of our story time. I've got a, like it feels like I've got a off, a defensive line about to plunge and sack the quarterback here. So I'm not really sure what's going on. Um, JJ was the first one up. What do you want to do? I wanna... No, what is JJ? I just want to end the live stream. <laughs> JJ wants to end the live stream. Daniel has an art gallery. So art gallery. we okay. will be right um, back. I, I don't know why I said right. Um, um, no, we no. will be back again. Um, probably not tomorrow. It'll probably be Thursday. And we will see you then. God bless you. And here's Daniel with the art gallery. Hello, this is Banana Man. Uh, I'm a banana and I've got a lot of appeal. Okay, this is what I drew yesterday. It's mirrored so it doesn't look how it should. Uh, um, stuff. yeah, it's called, his name is Captain Rex from Star Wars The Clone Wars and The Bad Batch. Bad Batch is awesome, I think you should watch it. Anyone who's watching <sighs> Star Wars. Okay, um, JJ. He's a nerd. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed, and... Today's video I also enjoyed, so bye guys.